to all of you. On behalf of Echo India, I welcome you all to today's session. As you know, Echo India, in collaboration with SBI Foundation, is doing an educational series on COVID-19. Today, we are in our fourth session of the series, and the topic for today is an update on vaccination in COVID-19 by our eminent guest speaker, Dr. Zareed F. Urwadia. While we gear up with vaccination in India, multiple states are reporting a shortage of vaccine. With this, there comes a lot of questions and information. I would like to invite Dr. Sandeep Bhalla, Associate Vice President at ECHO India to formally start the session. Over to you, Dr. Bhalla. Yeah, thank you, Deepa. Very good evening to everyone. And uh, thank you, for Dr. Zari Rudwadia, sir, for joining as an eminent uh, national expert for this today's session. In the last 24 hours, there has been at around 3.62 lakh new COVID infections and more than 4,000 deaths. India is in crisis and COVID cases are surging all across. Work on vaccine, drugs, medical devices, diagnostics, digital tools, and innovative approaches to strengthening health systems have accelerated. Uh, there has been a lot of discussions everywhere about the vaccine and what should be the government strategy to speed up the vaccination process in India. We have around 17.4 crore doses given, 3.73 crores people in India have received two doses. This makes 2.7% of the population total vaccinated in the country so far. Yet there is a huge population that needs either the one dose or the both the jabs. There has been a shortage of COVID-19 vaccinations, all vaccines also in some of the states. I, everyone 18 and older is eligible to get vaccine against COVID-19. There are recent developments which have happened today by the government of India that uh, the government panel, National Technical Advisory Group for the Immunization, they announced that there is going to be a gap of 12 to 16 weeks for COVID shield two shots. This is the second time in the country and that COVID shield dosage intervals have been widened uh, in March. First it widened in March and today they again announced this. No change was suggested for COVID vaccine, which remains at four to six weeks. The National Technical Advisory Panel Group has also suggested that uh, vaccine can be given to the pregnant woman as well as they can choose the vaccine and lact lactating women will also be eligible after delivery. Currently, neither of them will be eligible to get the shots. There has those, these recommendations will be sent to the National Expert Group on vaccine administration for approval before they are going to be implemented. Today, again, the expert panel approves co-vaccine for phase two of the three trials on two to 18 years older also. Dr. V.K. Paul, the member of the Niti Yog, he has announced today that next from the next week, Sputnik vaccines are going to be there available in India. And from July, the production of the Sputnik vaccine is also going to start. WHO statement has also come today that vaccine effectiveness on India dominant variants, that is B1.617 remains uncertain. So there are a lot of uh, doubts uh, regarding the and various priorities among the vaccines and there needs to be a lot to be done to reach to the herd immunity. We have our special uh, national expert, Dr. Ziri Rudwadia today with us to talk on an update on vaccination on COVID-19. Sir is a consultant at and chest, physician, uh, chest physicians and, and attached to the Hinduja Hospital and Research Center, Breach Kennedy Hospital, Parsi General Hospital. He strikes the unique balance of combining uh, a busy clinical practice with internationally acclaimed medical research. He's a prolific researcher and has over 170 public uh, PubMed index medical research publications in the world premium journals. He had given two TED talks also, one on the drug resistant tuberculosis and the other one is on COVID-19, both which has been widely viewed. He's on the core committee of the doctors elected by the Indian government to inform Mumbai's COVID-19 pandemic response. Uh, and we welcome you, sir, and uh, over to you, sir, for the today's session on behalf of Eco India and on behalf of SBA Foundation, which has given us this education grant to run this webinar series. We are really thankful for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep and Deepa. I'll just try and share my screen. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you see my screen just now? My slides? Yes, sir, we can see, sir. The first slide is seen just now? 
Yes, sir. It is there. Lovely. And you can hear me as well, clearly? Very clearly, sir. Great. So let me begin then. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, mine is a general talk on the vaccines, and I'll try and make it uh, as current as possible. Uh, so I would say that the development of a vaccine against a new viral pathogen in less than a year must rank as one of mankind's greatest scientific achievements. And certainly it's the, it's the highlight of the achievements uh, as far as this pandemic goes, because look, drugs-wise, we're not doing well at all in terms of therapeutics. Our larder is very empty. Apart from steroids, which we know make a difference, uh, remdesivir, which possibly makes a difference, and tocilizumab, which two recent studies in the Lancet and New England Journal of Medicine have shown might make a difference in a select group of patients. We have nothing that can really affect the cause of this pandemic as much as vaccines can. But delivering billions of doses across the globe will be one of the greatest logistical challenges that we have faced. And vaccines are so useful because they prevent these three crucial things. They prevent severe illness, hospitalization, and death. And sadly, we are seeing so much of all three over the last few months, especially in this second wave. So it's a race on between the vaccines and between the variants. And for humanity's sake, indeed, one hopes that uh, the vaccines win. So there are 12 vaccines currently deployed and in use across the globe as we speak. 70 are in phase three trials, more than 175 in preclinical studies. And the biggest vaccine campaign in the world is well and truly underway. So far, 1.34 billion doses have been given across 175 countries. And that is current data from just yesterday when I updated this slide. We are giving them out at a rate of 21 million doses a day. And that's truly a, a fairly unique a global achievement. These are the different vaccines that are available, including the developer and the flag tells you which country they've come from. And you can see that the US uh, and Europe lead the field. China also has three candidates. India has only one indigenous candidate, which is Covaxin from Bharat Biotech. And this tells you that there are different kinds of vaccines, mRNA, the uh, inactivated uh, virus vaccines, chimp virus for the Oxford, for example, protein vaccines, inactivated vaccines, and there's a variety of mechanisms by which this mix of vaccines work. And uh, about three or four months ago, the world crossed this symbolic milestone on this date when the number of COVID vaccines carried out globally finally surpassed the total number of cases across the globe. And again, this is from yesterday's uh, uh, Bloomberg vaccine tracker, so it's current, and it's a world map of vaccines. And you can see the darker the shade, the more the country has been vaccinated. And uh, India is not particularly dark, 175 million doses have been given. And you can see how North America, parts of Europe dominate on this world map as you'd expect. And our coverage as of yesterday was 6.4% of the population only. So a large number of doses, you might think, at 175 million. But break that down into number of people in this country, and that's only 6% of the population covered. And sadly, it's the usual contrast you would expect between the developed and the developing world, so that North America is vaccinated. As of yesterday, 50% of its population, Europe 36% or a third, while across Asia, those rates are just 14%, sadly. And in Africa, just 1% of the population has been vaccinated. And if you break that down by country, I can summarize by saying that Seychelles, for example, leads with 70% of its population vaccinated. Israel has vaccinated 60% of its population. The UK, a little more than half. And India, as I said, just 6%. So that's putting it in perspective when you break down country by country. Look at our neighbor, Bhutan, vaccinated almost all its adults against COVID-19 in a week much, much smaller country than ours, but we wish that we had anything nearing the kind of vaccine rates that these other countries have shown. And of course, the fortunate countries which have successfully vaccinated their problem can boast of immunity passports. And whatever the ethics of having an immunity passport are, there is little doubt that uh, the world will soon be divided into those who have these passports and can brandish them 
and those sadly who will never get an immunity passport, more difficult to get it seems in this country than any green card. And the real world impact of vaccines is apparent in countries which have received them. So this is data from across Israel and you can see that within, this is 14 or 15 days from the first vaccine dose, the number of lab confirmed infections came exponentially down and the number of hospitalizations within day 15 of the first dose came down to close to zero, which is where it currently stands. In Scotland, the Pfizer jab cut the risk of admissions by up to 90% within four weeks after the first dose and the Astra jab cut that risk by 94%. So the real world impact of vaccines in countries which have been wise enough, uh, calculating enough, prudent enough, and none of those sadly apply to this country of ours, have been dramatic. About 50% of people in UK now have antibodies, a level approaching herd immunity, which is the ultimate aim, by a combination of previous infections and vaccines. And that prompted a British general practitioner to say the vaccine is pure liquid hope, which is what we all agree. But then why the slow rollout across the world? It's a question of vaccine availability, of vaccine hesitancy, fears about side effects, most of them perceived and not real, anti-vaccine sentiments, there will always be a hardcore lobby of anti-vax uh, people and population across the country and the world, and sadly, inequity. So Astra, Pfizer and Moderna estimate a total production capacity by the end of this year of 5.3 billion. And this would therefore, if you give two doses to everyone, would cover 2.6 billion people by the end of this year, which will leave still huge numbers of people across the globe unvaccinated. And large chunks of these vaccines have already been bought up by the EU and other rich countries, the US, Canada, etc., who have pre-ordered, who've had the foresight to pre-order 50% of this including options written into their contacts, contracts to order even extra doses. But sadly, people in low-income countries may have to wait and wait how long until 2024 it is estimated to receive their vaccine. It is hoped, but I doubt that countries will be altruistic enough to donate their surplus need to countries which actually need it. And look at the fortunate situation US, for example, finds itself in. These are one, two, three, four, five different vaccines that they have in stock. So the situation in the US, unlike in this country, is such that you can literally walk into a vaccine center and choose the vaccine you want on the same day without an appointment. But there is this great inequity where immunization has yet to begin in several sub-Saharan African countries. If you think we are bad, think of poor Africa. And 130 countries and 2.5 billion people have yet to receive a single dose of vaccine. Unprotected healthcare worker colleagues in countries across Africa continue to die of COVID. And uneven vaccine distribution is exacerbating the existing healthcare inequities. So closing this gap is not just a moral imperative, but would bring worldwide econ economic recovery. As a Nigerian GP wrote, the rich live the, die, the poor die, matter of cash, really sad, which is really a true reflection of what the state of vaccine rollout across the globe has been. Fake vaccines thrive across the dark net. Vaccine hesitancy continues to plague countries with adequate supply. And let's take the sorry case that India finds itself in just now. India's vaccine rollout has stumbled in a big way. Ask anyone who desperately lines up at vaccine centers. In fact, five days ago, India had its highest number of COVID cases in this second wave in excess of 400,000. And that's an underestimate, my friends. Believe me, I would guess that the true number of cases every single day in this country are much closer to 1 million or more. Anyway, on the day that we had our highest number of cases, we had our lowest number of vaccines across the country. Why? Because vaccines had just run out. We did not, this Modi government did not have the foresight, the insight to plan. 
in an act of generosity which borders on the insane, we gave out vaccines to 145 countries in March because we felt that we would not receive a second wave. So by March, we had given more vaccines than we had actually given our people. Can you imagine the folly of that, not anticipating a second wave, not hoarding up on vaccine stocks as other countries had done? So two months into its vaccine campaign, India is struggling to get even healthcare workers to turn up for their doses and receive their doses. Of the stated goal of inoculating 300 million people by August, only a tiny fraction had received their vaccine in the first month. And at this pace, it will take four years to reach this target. Possible reasons? Well, at the time the vaccine rollout first began, we were in the fortunate position of having ended our first wave and cases were in genuine decline. On the day the vaccine rollout started, there were just 10,000 cases across India, which was the lowest they had ever been. This reduced the perception of th threat. At the same vaccines been available at the peak of the pandemic, for example, in the first wave in September, <coughs> believe me, the uptake, uptake would have been different. There was unfounded fear about vaccine side effects. There were questions about vaccine efficacy. There was hasty fast tracking by the government of the indigenous co-vaccine. At that time, there was very limited or no phase three data out on this vaccine. And there were practical issues, this huge population, many of them illiterate, a malfunctioning app. And now with the second wave having well and truly hit, vaccine hesitancy has been replaced by vaccine desperation. These are the cues. And this is an orderly cue, I would say, of people just waiting to get their vaccine. Vaccine centers are now super spreader events. This is an orderly queue, certainly not three meters apart as is recommended, but there are hordes and fighting mobs at some of the centers. I know because I work at three hospitals which also double up as vaccine centers. And there are angry mobs struggling to get their hands on the limited doses of vaccine currently available. And there is general vaccine skepticism across the globe. Look, we are not a vaccine skeptic country. India, for example, would you get a COVID shot if and when it becomes available? At that time, six months ago, only about 15% had said they would not. They were skeptics compared to France, for example, where as many as 40% said they would not get a vaccine shot, even if it was available. So vaccine skepticism is present across the globe. But look at the time to herd immunity. In the US, for example, they find itself in the enviable position of just being 89 days away from reaching herd immunity. That is 70% of the population vaccinated. And this change occurred with the change in government, with the change in the president, of course. You saw the disastrous campaign that Trump mounted, and you can see how things considerably improved and changed with the Biden administration. In India, sadly, if we continue as we are, and this is data fed into time to herd, a very good vaccine tracker, we are 756 days away, my friend. That is well over two and a half years from reaching 70% or herd immunity. So we have miles to go. Then there are anti-vaccine conspiracy theories so that genuinely educated people are frightened to take the vaccine. Uh, death by WhatsApp, I call it. And people believe in at least one conspiratorial COVID belief many of them focused around vaccines. And a group of experts in Nature magazine were asked what they felt would be the biggest driving factors in this pandemic. And apart from uneven vaccine distribution and waning immunity, about a third listed vaccine hesitancy as one of the factors. Indeed, I would say the ultimate impact of COVID vaccines in a population will depend more on the prevalence of vaccine hesitancy, vaccine availability, then on this theoretical argument about which vaccine has 90% efficacy and which vaccine has 70% efficacy. Sometimes religious beliefs come in the way of vaccination. The Tanzanian president said COVID-19 vaccines are dangerous, unnecessary, 
and God will protect this nation from this disease. He died one month after making this statement, sadly, of COVID. Indian vaccines, we have the Astra Oxford vaccine or Covishield, which is a non-replicating viral vector vaccine, a chimp vector, and CHAD OX1 is the name. And the other available vaccine is the Bharat Serum or Covaxin vaccine, which is an inactivated vaccine with heat and formaldehyde. In the pipeline, but nowhere near being available, are a number of other candidates, which uh, we wait to see the light of day. The first study showing the efficacy of the Axford Obstra vaccine came from uh, multiple trials across Brazil, South Africa, and the UK reported about uh, six months ago in the Lancet. And it showed that this vaccine had an overall efficacy of about 70%. But we worried because only 6% of the population in this large study were more than 65 years of age. And they also showed for complicated reasons we won't go into that the efficacy seemed to be better in those who had a longer dosing interval between the two doses, three months as opposed to one month. But then we had more recent data released from the US Astra vaccine study, even more participants which showed much better efficacy rates, close to 80%. Large numbers of these people were over 65. And here the dosing interval was just four weeks. And then finally, we had phase three data from out of the Bharat Serum vaccine study, again in the Lancet, which showed that this was an effective vaccine, again, fortunately, with about 80% efficacy. And it's nice to know that they did include younger people as well in their study up to 12 and above. And I won't compare the differences between the two vaccines, but let me list quickly the 12 commonest vaccine questions I'm asked. And these happen every single day, sadly, hundreds of times. Which vaccine should I take, doctor? Are they safe? Who should not be vaccinated? Is there any contraindication? Will they work against variants? What is the ideal duration between doses? Can I take more than two doses and can different vaccines be combined? Are they safe in pregnancy? Are they safe in children? When should I be vaccinated if I have had COVID? How many doses do I need if I have had COVID? What is my chance of getting COVID if I have been vaccinated? And will I need a booster? And I've covered them all, believe me, so I think we'll have very little to discuss in the Q&A period because this really is a comprehensive list of the questions that you can and will be asked by your patients and by your colleagues. So in brief, let me attempt to answer them all. Which vaccine should I take, of course, is at the top of that list or was at the top of the list when you did have choices, you don't have any now, but the answer has always been the same. Any vaccine you can quickly access. Take the first vaccine you can get instead of shopping around it's important to vaccinate people with whatever vaccine is available rather than indulge in vaccine shopping if your aim is to achieve herd immunity. Is one vaccine superior to the other? It is hard to say because you've not compared head to head the Moderna versus the Astra vaccine or the Pfizer versus the Johnson vaccine. The results of 75% efficacy or 90% efficacy occurred when that particular trial was conducted. And each trial was conducted at different times in the pandemic, in different populations, who had different strains and different variants at the time the study was compared. So what do vaccine efficacy numbers actually mean? Well, this study shows that there are large estimate efficacy ranges across populations. Some vaccines were, were done at the time when there were widespread variants. So naturally, they were a little less effective than the studies from Moderna and Pfizer where there were no variants at the time. These were earlier vaccines, for example. So the bottom line is you cannot compare the Moderna and the Novavax, the Pfizer and the Johnson, for example, for the reasons I've told you. And I hope I've made that clear. And our own Soumya in the WHO has said that like we have RCTs for everything, every drug, every study, even a vaccine trial should ideally not be exempt from the gold standard of an RCT, comparing vaccine with vaccine. 
Sadly, in these days of desperation, that is not likely to happen, and we will happily accept any vaccine that is shown to have reasonable efficacy. Because efficacy, all the vaccines do have. And more important, and this is the bottom line, that any vaccine should ideally give close to 100% efficacy in preventing hospitalization and preventing death. A vaccine worth its salt should keep you out of hospital, should keep you out of ICU, should keep you out of the morgue. Next question, are the vaccines safe? So far, they seem to be safe and remarkably safe. There are some safety signals, but many false alarms. And remember that never before in history have such large numbers of people been vaccinated so rapidly. So vaccines will inevitably seem to be temporally associated with some rare adverse effect or the other. I'm not saying you dismiss those adverse effects. Continued careful monitoring will be required. But is it safe with all these hundreds of different conditions which you are going to ask me about? The answer, yes, yes, yes. And this is a study looking at how effective and safe the vaccine is in this very critical group of immunosuppressed patients. That's what we need to know. Efficacy in special subsets, and it's happening. Trials across the West are happening as we speak in immunosuppressed populations, cancer patients, liver patients, transplant patients, and we await the data from such studies. Is there anyone in this world who should not be vaccinated? Very few. During an acute illness, no one would recommend vaccination. During active COVID, no one would recommend vaccination. And if you are hypersensitive to any of the components of the vaccine, not hypersensitive as in drug allergies or food allergies, then you should not be vaccinated with that particular vaccine. Allergic reactions with vaccines have got lots of attention, but they are excessively rare and they are rarely very dangerous the kind of vaccine reactions that are usually cutaneous that can occur. And look, after dose one, this patient had a large local reaction, but there was no recurrence when he received dose two. ITP-like illnesses have been reported, and you can see the bruising here, post-Moderna vaccine. Axillary glands have been reported, and that's why they can confuse breast physicians and surgeons, and you're advised to delay a mammography because you can get lymph nodes, especially on the sides of the side of the vaccine. But then came this very real red flag about blood clots and venous thrombosis after the Oxford Astra vaccine. This led to the vaccine being suspended promptly across large parts of Europe. And you know how paranoid they can be in parts of Europe about any safety signal coming through. And uh, the European regulator said that there was plausible data to link this to rare brain clots. I'm talking of venous thrombosis, venous sinus thrombosis, sagittal vein thrombosis, very rare events on their own. So 20 EU countries paused vaccination because of these rare side effects. They were rare, they usually with thrombocytopenia. So this combination of clotting and thrombocytopenia, so bruising, bleeding, and then severe headaches is what you should ask your patients to report. It has been, hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. You can yeah. hear me. Yes, it, said my, it said my internet is unstable. Sorry. And the WHO recommended that you continue using the vaccine. Very clearly, they were not keen on the even the temporary cessation, and they said the benefit will outweigh the risk, which of course it will do, but the European regulators, after a lull, allowed it, but with a clear package insert at the inside every vaccine. There are three important studies which brought this to light, two in the New England Journal of Medicine from different parts of Europe, and one in JAMA from the US. <clears throat> And what is the treatment of this vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia? VIIT is what it's called. 
Well, the treatment is to avoid blood thinners. Paradoxically, you cannot use heparin or low molecular weight heparin. You can consider possibly one of the novel oral anticoagulants, but the treatment is steroids and intravenous gamma globulin. So they're extremely rare, but be alert for them when millions and millions of people are vaccinated, even extremely rare will add up to significant numbers. And there is a simple test, which is not done in either of the two hospitals that I'm attached to, even though these are good centers, the platelet factor four antibody test. Patients who have this VIIT syndrome usually have antibodies to platelet factor four. <clears throat> so that's some clinical information on this reaction. But it's really sad and it's a shame because the world's most widely deployed vaccine is the Astra vaccine, as you know. It's been used in 175 countries. It's the cheapest, it's easiest to store, it's easiest to give. And as Eric Topol said from the FDA, the world, the species depends on this vaccine. This is 2.5 billion people's worth of vaccine. So let's hope that more and more of these reactions are not reported over time. Even more important in the midst of this second wave is this million dollar question. Will the, virus, will the, will the vaccines work against variants? And these are the five variants of concern and just Yesterday, the Indian variant was classified, the B.1.617, which has two mutations, the E484Q and the L452R, which I do believe confer this variant with uh, more infectivity and perhaps worse outcomes. Because if you ask me what I'm seeing in this wave compared to what I saw when the pandemic first started about 400 days ago, I would put my hand on my heart and say that more and more people in a family are being infected, i.e. these strains currently are more infectious. And I'm seeing that they are affecting younger people more frequently. I've seen people dying in their sadly 20s, 30s and 40s, which didn't happen in the first strain or the first wave, and I'm seeing worse outcomes, definitely worse outcomes. So this is very frightening, and to my mind points that the kind of strain we are seeing right now is caused by a different variant. Do we know which variant it is? Sadly, and this is to the shame of our scientific community and of the ICMR, let me spell it out, you know how blunt I can be and will be. We have sequenced, we have done gene sequencing on less than 0.01% of all the viruses going around just now. Can you believe that? The UK has invested 20 million pounds in a daily sequencing campaign. So like a radar, they pick up a new strain as it emerges. We still do not know whether the current strain is caused by the traditional virus, I don't think it is, by the UK variant as we once thought, or by this Indian double mutant first reported in Maharashtra, sadly. But there is no doubt as the WHO declared just two days ago, or one day ago, that this variant is now a global problem, the one we first found in India, and they upgraded it to variant of concern from variant of significance. It has now already been found in 44 countries, showing you that everyone needs to worry when the virus rampages through one particular country. But if you ask me, our variation from COVID specific behavior is and should be the main variant of concern. You saw how three months ago, no one was bothered with masks. Large crowds were allowed to gather at uh, election rallies. 25 million people gathered at the Kum Mela cumulatively. So that kind of variation from correct behavior is the true variant of concern. Perhaps we shouldn't be too worried about variants because that is what all viruses do especially RNA viruses. Mutation rates of SARS-CoV-2 are still less than that of influenza, 
Neutralizing antibody titers post-vaccine are reassuringly found in some of the initial studies. And we don't know the effect of vaccines, remember, on T cells. We talk about antibodies all the, all the time. That's B cell response, but we don't know what's happening to T cells, which I do believe are also primed by having had a vaccination or a prior infection. And all vaccine trials on all variants at least show what I told you earlier, that they seem to eradicate severe disease. And the hope is that vaccines can be tweaked as variants come along. <clears throat> that is, of course, if we know which variants we have circulating in our community, and we don't. And again, this is a study which showed efficacy of different vaccines against different variants. And you can see, for example, that uh, they all seem to be effective, but perhaps not so against some of them. And they were all effective in preventing severe COVID across all the variants, which is something good to know. So the news that the AstraZeneca vaccine worked against two of the variant strains, the UK and the Brazilian variant was very reassuring, but it showed poor efficacy as you can see against the South African strain. And you can see how antibody levels post vaccine were that much lower against the South African variant compared to the much higher levels against the normal strain. And with the new Indian double variant and its two mutations, we really don't know. It is hoped and prayed that the two vaccines currently available are effective against the Indian variants. We just don't know. Isn't this crucial data that we would expect our scientists to have given us by now? So what do we need to combat mutants as and when they come across? Vaccinate as many as you can, as fast as you can with the vaccines available. Uh, fast track to next generation vaccines. Tweak your existing ones. And the mRNA vaccines are much easier to tweak, but much harder to scale up. So all the advances in next gen vaccines will come from the mRNA vaccines. And of course, we cannot access these, sadly. And a few companies are already developing next generation vaccines, which would generate responses protecting against multiple strains and directed not just at the spike protein, but against multiple epitopes, eliciting T cell responses as well. Next question you're asked is what is the ideal duration between doses? Now, you know this big controversy about should it be four weeks, should it be 12 weeks? Remember that this was not a head-to-head -head comparison. A small number of participants in the original Astra Oxford trial happened to receive their second dose at 12 weeks. And those patients seemed to have a higher vaccine efficacy. But this was not a head-to-head -head comparison. And when I mentioned the US trial, there was an 80% efficacy with the Astra vaccine, and all second doses were given at four weeks. So while the WHO recommends the second dose at eight to 12 weeks, the CDC says six weeks, the ICMR says four to eight weeks, and more recently delayed it even longer. And they're delaying it because we just don't have the vaccine in stock. So this is not a decision based on science. It's a decision based on the fact that there is no vaccine available in this country. In the UK, it was 12 weeks. Again, a carefully made decision so more people could be vaccinated with the first dose. But if you asked me, when would I like to have my second dose? I would say, if it's available, give it to me four weeks after the first dose. I've seen too many people come in with serious COVID infections after their first dose. Some of them greedily waiting for antibody responses to mount as we were first told they might do when we had the luxury of vaccines and we could choose when to go for our second dose. As I said now, sadly, there is no choice. And many people who have been waiting two, two and a half or three months have just not received their second doses. And there are pros and cons of early versus late vaccine, which we don't have time to go into. There is no data on how long a delay is safe without compromising efficacy, as I said. I would still maintain, as I said, and I've stuck my neck out and said this, and uh, the government has not appreciated this, second dose at four weeks is ideal if you have the choice. 
Should you take more than two doses? Please do not at present. These vaccines have all been designed as one or two doses. Only the Johnson actually is one. It's unclear how much additional benefit you will get and how much risk you will incur. Dr. Fauci has proposed a third dose after a year to top up the antibodies that might be more practical than a new vaccine altogether. Can you combine vaccines? I'm asked this all the time. Oh, I want to take one Pfizer dose and one COVID shield or one co-vaccine and one COVID shield. Not recommended at present. It is possible, and there's a study in today's Lancet that says that this approach may be more immunogenic. You might get better antibodies, but they also showed this caused much more severe reactions, local reactions, fever, arm pain, when a different second vaccine dose was given. And there are trials actually looking at this as we speak. Is it safe in pregnancy? Yes, we have data now saying that these vaccines are safe and recommended in pregnancy. Pregnancy should not be a contraindication. However, that data comes from the mRNA vaccines. And sadly, we have no such data from the Indian vaccines. Are they safe in children? No reason why they should, but data has been limited. I wouldn't say no data. They're considered, kids are considered a low priority, but don't forget they're important reservoirs of infection. And if you vaccinate kids, you could open up schools, you could speed up your target of reaching herd immunity. Because look, children under the age of 15 account for a quarter of your globe's population. So Israel, for example, has begun to vaccinate all adolescents now with the Pfizer vaccine and now will go up to the age of 13 years. And trials in even pediatric patients up to the age of three are underway as we speak. Six months to 11 years is the current design of a Moderna vaccine trial. What about vaccines given to someone who has recovered from COVID? Yes, you should give them because it's not sure how long your natural immunity will last. And it does wane over time, I would say perhaps three or six months. So I would recommend as the CDC does, give your second dose of vaccine 90 days after COVID infection if your patient has been infected between the first two doses. Patients with past COVID do need to vaccinate themselves and this study showed that vaccination should be done, otherwise you were at risk of reinfection. Uh, some people have argued that even one dose of vaccine may be enough in someone who has had a case of SARS-CoV-2 infection in the past, but there is debate on that, and the current consensus is that you should still have your two doses. What is the chance of COVID after vaccination? Look, no vaccine offers 100% protection. Vaccines are not bulletproof. There are sad cases of healthcare workers in this country, and I've spoken to colleagues in Delhi today who say in one particular hospital, they have lost two healthcare workers who had received both doses of the vaccine and the second dose over four weeks after the, the time they incurred a fatal COVID infection, which is really tragic and frightening. But no vaccine is 100%. It's much harder for vaccinated patients to get infected, but do not think for one second that you cannot get infected. What every vaccine should offer, and we still hope offers, is near 100% protection from what I told you. Severe infection, need for ICU, mortality. But frighteningly, we are not seeing that at 100% levels for sure. 25%, I did a rough back of the envelope calculation of my 75 admissions currently at one of my hospitals just now. A quarter of them are those who have received one dose of vaccine already more than four weeks ago. So don't wait is my advice. How common is infection after vaccine? This is a nice study from out of healthcare workers in California and 36,000 of them who continued after vaccination to have weekly PCR tests. That's a great study because they kept having a swab after vaccination every week as part of hospital policy. And 379 of this 36,000 tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, i.e the risk was 1% after vaccination of getting infection. 
the majority within seven days of the first dose. And as the days post-vaccine increased, the chance of getting positive were exponentially decreasing. So only seven out of 379, a very, very small number, less than 1% tested positive and got COVID after two weeks of the second dose. So it's very rare, but it can occur. Colleagues here, please don't let down your guard. It underscores the critical importance of continuing with your public health measures. How common is hospitalization after vaccine? In the UK, 4% were hospitalized after vaccination. Next question, will I need to take a booster dose over time? Yes, you probably will, like you do for influenza, like you do for tetanus. How frequently? I would guess about every year. And these are my last couple of slides. Remember, as India's horrendous second surge has reminded us, a me-first approach to vaccination will not defeat COVID. Global cooperation is needed. And there are some great bodies, uh, the WHO, the Gates Foundation, is behind bodies like COVAX, Gavi, CEPI, which are pooling their resources together and pooling vaccines together for the developing world. And this was such a heartwarming sight when a cargo plane arrived in Ghana in February, carrying six lakh Astra vaccines, developed in Britain, manufactured in India, sourced with needles from Dubai, and this was an initiative backed by countries across the globe to save Ghanaian lives, which would otherwise perhaps never have received the vaccine for who knows, two, three or four years more. What will it take to vaccinate the world against COVID-19? I'll tell you, the maths is simple. It will need 11 billion doses to vaccinate 70% of the world's population if you want to give each person two doses. So we're a long, long away, away from that, sadly. We need companies to work together to boost vaccine production, to share technology. Do you think that will ever happen? I doubt it. You need intellectual property rights to be waived, as India and South Africa have boldly campaigned at the WTO. And it was heartwarming to see that the Biden administration seemed to be bending in this direction. Countries with excess vaccine should donate their surplus via WHO, via Gavi make vaccine access easy for the non-tech savvy. How is a poor Indian farmer going to log on on an app which he cannot figure out the use of and use this country's extensive polio vaccine experience, for example, that has been one of our few public health success stories to rapidly scale up vaccination across this country. And this, I think, is my last slide because it's a nice quote from the New England Journal of Medicine, which says, vaccinating the world is not only a moral obligation, it also serves our own self-interest, protects our security, health, and economy. These goals will not be accomplished by making the world wait for wealthy countries to be vaccinated first. Getting the world vaccinated may well be the critical test of our time. America is at present sitting on 200 million doses of the Astra vaccine, which they don't plan to use because they have many vaccines from different companies, enough to vaccinate their whole population twice over. Surely these could be donated to countries struggling as India is in the midst of a deadly second wave. I'm going to stop here. And uh, I Thank think you, we have about 10 minutes exactly because I have to leave at eight yeah. shots. So Thank you, sir, for uh, giving the elaborative talk on the vaccination because there are a lot of uh, uh, queries and the myths which have been associated with the vaccination. I think we straight away, sir, we can go to the queries and the questions which sure. are there in the chat box so that, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, there is a query that even after taking two doses vaccine, any chance of getting COVID? I think I've answered that question. I, I've talked yeah. to doctors in Delhi where two colleagues in a hospital have died after two yeah. doses. So don't let your guard down. No vaccine, 100%. Thank you, sir. Is there is a possibility of vaccine for mucromycosis? Because mucromycosis is a big... Uh, mucromycosis medicine. is a fungal infection and you need to treat it. First of all, you need to prevent it. We have used such dread... Our, our treatment is in such shambles. Any new drug we hear about, we will throw at our patients. We use steroids in industrial doses. 
the solidarity trials showed that six milligrams of DEXA was the dose that you needed. But we used three, four, five times that dose predisposing patients to high sugars and therefore mucormycosis. Mucormycosis is treated by expensive antifungal drugs like amphotericin and isovaconazole. You don't need a vaccine for it. Thank you, sir. How, how can we monitor VVM? Sorry, how can we monitor? VVM, so vaccine while, while monitoring, sir. VVM. It's a, this is basically said the vaccine while monitoring system is in the polio vaccine also we were having that how we can we monitor so my friend, you'll, need, you'll answer that question if you know what it stands for what can the country do from this point on to increase the vaccination well you need to have you needed to have told your main producers like the pune company in advance exactly how many doses you needed apparently we did not you needed to have planned in advance for a dreadful second wave, which we clearly did not do. You needed to not be nationalistic about it, but to have bought in bulk as many vaccines from as many countries as we possibly could. And now the tap is completely dry and we are in dreadful, dreadful straits. Even if we had enough vaccines for everyone at this point in time, millions will die and the vaccine will only prevent the third wave from hitting as hard as the second wave has done. So it's a dreadful state of affairs. So as an average uh, a primary care physician or a doctor, how do we, how they can promote vaccination? What are, what are the various Good point. Of? Good point. So every patient who comes to me, whether he comes to me these days for asthma or tuberculosis, I say, I hope you've taken your vaccine. And many of them are in the situation saying that, yes, I've taken my first dose dog, but I've not taken my second. When is it coming? Many will say that they've taken their two doses and I say, well done. And many will say, should I take it? Do you know, do you think it's worth taking it? I'm worried about side effects. So every patient interaction is a chance to educate your patient about how the vaccine safety will far outweigh any theoretical risks that they may have heard about. So make every interaction a chance to promote vaccination. Having said that, it's awkward to promote vaccination when there are no vaccines available. Thank you, sir. So uh, there is an issue regarding the cold chain, cold chain maintenance. If it is a poor, how the potency of the vaccine can be checked? Well, it, it can be affected very, very significantly, as we all know. But the advantage of the two Indian vaccines are at least that they don't need the extreme cold storage that uh, the mRNA vaccines need. And eight degrees is the temperature of an average frigidaire. So that should not be an issue even across most of the country. What can the country do for, to get the more vaccines in the because India is now facing a huge issue of uh, vaccination shortage. So how, how we can? I make... think exactly what we're doing, pushing up, telling, getting the ingredients which our local manufacturers need to ramp up their production and encouraging them at every step instead of blaming them, number one, and then reaching out to China, to Russia, with a begging bowl in hand, and India often seems to be too proud to do that, with a begging bowl in hand, I will say, to get as much vaccine as we can. Thank you, sir. There is a publication today in the Lancet that 12 weeks apart dosing works as well. What are your comments? What are your views on that, sir? Well, that is not what I'm seeing with the effect of the vaccine in this current strain. I told you so many people in the ICU on ventilators who have received one dose of the vaccine more than four weeks apart. So let the data come out on the efficacy of the vaccines on the current strain. We don't have that convincing data available yet. And then we can decide what the ideal vaccine period should be. Maybe we will find that we need for this particular variant going around, when we know which variant it is, that you quickly need to give four doses to get any kind of good antibody response. Then it would be unwise to recommend a three month period. I think that three month recommendation is mainly because of a practical uh, need to expose as many people to at least one dose. Uh, which vaccine is preferable for sickle cell disease and thalassemia? I don't think there's any difference between the two vaccines, Covishield and Covaxin, in this population of patients, including patients with cancer, for example. There is no evidence that the dead vaccine, the Covaxin, is superior, like some oncologists recommend. And the international recommendations are that either could be used. Thank you, sir. Just go by what you can grab, what is available, what is accessible. Thank you. 
what should be done if there is a mixing of doses in that inadvertently is rare as i said and today's lancet said that you can get more immunogenicity probably better antibody responses so it may not be a bad thing but they pointed out that you can get much worse local reactions more fever uh, more inflammation so it's not recommended at present as i said i did answer that question yeah now there is another query sir will it be too early that there should be a gap of three to four weeks for second dose I think four weeks is, is what they used in the second Astra study. With that kind of dosing, you got 80% vaccine efficacy. And that is good enough for me to accept instead of waiting for two months and three months, hoping that your antibody levels will go up. That was the initial reasoning behind the wait. Because in the original Astra study, they showed that your antibody response was better, that the vaccine efficacy was more potent. But I don't think it is wise to wait, especially in the face of the wave that we are experiencing now. Can patient taking the COVID vaccines be given pneumococcal or influenza yes, vaccine? Of course, of course, not on the same day, maybe or the same couple of days, but you don't need to budge from your pneumonia vaccine schedule or your influenza. But having said that, it's quite remarkable that all across the world, influenza rates have fallen dramatically. We don't see influenza because everyone is masked up. So now we know how to prevent influenza across the globe. More than vaccines have everyone wearing a mask. Uh, there is a query regarding uh, that I have been found COVID positive on 7th April. When can I get my first dose of vaccination? It's three months, 90 days after they had the COVID. You don't need to take it earlier because you will have very good antibody levels. So why take it? Take it a little later and it will last you that much longer. After taking one, the first one, dose, one yeah. COVID infect a COVID infection is like a second vaccine dose almost. Yeah. After taking the first dose, if someone is diagnosed positive in RT PCR before the second dose, then when second dose should be given? Three months later, after the COVID, after the after the COVID infection was diagnosed. Okay. Uh, my daughter is twenty three year old. She has a chronic uh, urticaria. Is that is she eligible for vaccination in case she's eligible? Well, which vaccine is well, best? Well, again, the government boldly announced that everyone over the age of 18 or 21 could get it. So yes, your daughter is eligible. Uh, which vaccine? I would say either again. The fact that you have urticaria, bad asthma, eczema, food allergy is not a reason not to take the Covishield vaccine, the Astra vaccine. So please go ahead and take either vaccine. In a younger person who has a tendency to clot formation, if that is an issue, then I would say go for the Covaxin because the clotting side effects, very rare, one in a million, have been reported with the Astra vaccine, and no such data has emerged, emerged with the Bharat Serum vaccine. I think last two, three questions, sir. Does anybody with the previous history of acute anaphylaxis to anti-tetanic serum can take uh, COVID vaccine? Anaphylaxis to what, sorry? Anti-tetanic serum, sir. Yeah, how often do we use anti-tetanic serum? I mean, so anaphylactic reaction to anything outside the components in the vaccine, you know, the dilutants in the vaccine is not a contraindication. Maybe uh -huh. such a person should go to a hospital as a vaccine center and be prepared in case there's a reaction. After first dose needed to take ARV after dog bite, so how many days after we need to take COVID vaccine because it is more than... It doesn't matter. Just don't combine two vaccines on the same day or in the same couple of days. That's all. What about the booster dose? I think, sir, you have already answered in your presentation. Yeah. Which one? Can a young stroke patient... Uh, uh, good, good question. Again, this is the kind of patient person yeah. with a background of DVT, background of pulmonary embolism, a young stroke. Maybe you'd say in, your, in, in that kind of patient, go for the uh, co-vaccine over the COVID shield because the side effects of clotting were reported with the COVID shield. Thank you. But you can take the other one for sure. Even one month after the two doses of Covaxin, if antibodies levels are not adequate, what should be done? Nothing you can do about it. But remember that your T cells are primed. Don't be obsessed by the antibody figure is my message. So many doctors almost have a com my antibody level. First of all, it must be neutralizing antibody, not general antibody. Spike protein neutralizing antibody. So whether it's 20 or whether it's 200, do we really know if it makes a difference? I don't think we do. Any antibody level is protective. You follow. Zero is worrying. Zero means that for some reason you have not mounted a response. 
whether we need to stop drugs like methotrexate before vaccination. The only drug you need to stop, not steroids, not azathioprine, is methotrexate. The week of the vaccine, the American Rheumatology Society says you should not take your methotrexate dose. Methotrexate is generally weekly. So if I take my COVID vaccine on Tuesday, I should not take that week's methotrexate dose, but then resume normally. I think last question, sir. How much antibody quantity can be uh, considered good enough as recently people before uh, taking the vaccine go for antibody test? I, I tried to answer that. We don't know the level of protect. There's no magic figure of 20 or 50 or 200. Uh, also remember, whatever your antibody levels, there is a whole other immune system, the T-cell system, which most experts feel is primed and ready. And there is no way of checking that outside very, very special tests. So even if your vaccine antibody levels are low, I think you can be reassured that you will have protection. Now, whether that protection is going to be 100%, sadly, we know it's not. That is the real worry. And whether that protection will extend to the variants that we are seeing now, again, is what we don't know and what we desperately need answers for. So, are vaccines safe for geriatric population? And Absolutely. Immunocom they may be a little less effective when you're 80 or 90 or close to 100. But yes, of course, the safety is not an issue. How immunogenic they are, we can't say. Maybe less than in a young person. I really need to run, Doc. It's yeah, I think, sir, we have, uh, we have covered all the queries and questions. I think we are really thankful on behalf of uh, Eco India and on behalf of our leadership of uh, Eco Institute, uh, Professor Sanjeev uh, Arora, as well as Eco India Trust, Dr. Colonel Kumudrai, as well as our executive director, Dr. Sunil Arnold, and all of our colleagues from Eco India. It's a really a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, I think this is a need of an hour. Vaccination is the only solution to get the immunity. And we have to make this drive as much possible, as fast as we can as some of the countries like uk uh, uk israel singapore thailand they have achieved their level in a big way because of only one reason that is the vaccination drive and i think we should also move uh, in a big way in our country for the vaccination drive that is the that is the summarization of your talk on behalf of eco india we are really thankful for sparing the valuable thank time you. thank you sir thank you very much thank stay you. safe sir stay thank safe you. thanks, thanks all, all the colleagues those who have joined today all of you too. thank you very much bye sir There's a feedback link uh, in the chat box for today, today's session. I request you all to please fill in that. And uh, I hope the session was wonderful and informative for you all. Our next session on COVID-19 series is scheduled tomorrow on May 14th at 6 p.m. by Dr. V. Mohan. And the topic is COVID-19 and diabetes. Do register yourself for that session. Thank you all for your participation. Have a wonderful evening. Stay healthy. Thank you all.